Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Simon Denny, and I have the pleasure to chair a panel um, called The Arts, Virtualizing Reality, Embracing Humanity, um, with some of my favorite thinkers in the uh, technology, art, and ethics space. Um, I am just going to share my screen because I prepared a little um, presentation to introduce the panel. Um, so here we go. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, like I said, the arts virtualizing reality embracing humanity. Um, it's a panel that is uh, built to have Matt Kane, um, Frank Jurgen, uh, me, uh, Simon Denny, Krista, Kim, Charlie Stein, uh, Lindsay Howard, Alana Roatsi, La Forette, uh, Ryan John King, and Troy Conrad uh, Therian um, speaking today. And um, we've been given the uh, introductory panel kind of uh, summary called, um, uh, which goes, uh, contemporary artists increasingly create and curate their works with new technologies, including blockchain, artificial intelligence, and virtual reality. The emergent digital art purports to bring us disruption through dialogue with enlightened technologists. Where are the boundaries between technology and humanism, and even empathy? Uh, how to embrace shared humanity with those new virtual forms of art, um, which is a very uh, provocative um, uh, opener, um, which I thought I would interpret by um, you know, uh, since we have a re relatively large panel um, and not so much time, uh, bounce out to the um, uh, illustrious guests we have here to introduce themselves. Um, so uh, to each of our panelists, introduce, introduce who you are and what you do. Um, and also um, to ask each panelist, what are your experiences? Where are technology and ethics meet? Um, and can you share maybe an example from your practice where humanism or some other ethical framework um, is, is key uh, to the experience of it. Um, and then I thought we'd come back to discuss together some shared points on these topics at the end, um, and then uh, take some questions if there are indeed any from the audience. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna unshare right now uh, again. Sorry, this is a new interface. Um, and uh, I might then, first of all, ask, um, I have uh, prepared some answers myself, but I might start by asking Charlie um, if she can first sure. respond to this um, question, if you will. Uh, so introducing yourself and then sharing some moment uh, where you encountered ethics at this juncture. All right. I think maybe I can thank you so much, Simon, for the introduction. Maybe I can just combine the, the two because as a visual artist, it's always nicer if you can actually see something. So mm -hmm. um, let me just do that quickly. I'm going to share the screen. This should work. And I think there we are, right? Yes. Okay. And as we tested before, I can't see you. So, so I just have to get audio feedback if something's not working. So um, my name is Charlie Stein. I'm a visual artist and based in Berlin. I work at the intersection of technology, visual conventions and digitization and gender. So my practice spans from drawing to painting, could be installation and video works. Um, and sometimes these boundaries are really blurry. So let's just dive right into it. We see here one of the exhibitions that I had this year. Um, it is in the virtual space. Um, that was in a gallery on an island, but as I said, it was Mozilla hub space. So I often work um, with this idea that um, there are robotic forms and there is a um, that there is some sort of femininity in, in these hybrids that I create. So I often work with painting these days. And um, as you can see here, they're also questioning all these um, social, no, not even social, like visual conventions that we see, for instance, in the digital image flood that we see on Instagram and social media in general. So I'm, I'm trying to use these forms, but then also make them almost artificial as in a way also beautification filters do. But it's also um, often the titles of the works 
are taken. There was another show I did in the physical space. So I always try to work with the space and, and create sort of an environment for the work. Um, but I also work with the idea of, of applications. So often the, these entities that I, that I depict are taken from the idea of, of being an application or being an AI. So, so here, for instance, is Siri and Alexa. But um, it could, or this is a good example, it's um, called TESS, this work, and it's referring to an application for mental health. So this is a, a bot, basically, that is um, helping humans with their utmost unrobotic um, response to problems that is their feeling to, um, to cure them of their anxiety or whatever. And this idea, this intersection, I find really interesting where we say we give part of our humanity away and, and have, have robotic um, um, forms or algorithms help us. And um, that, that happens in care robots. We see that a lot. Um, so we have um, often female connoted care robots. So there is a, is a huge um, um, gender implication that can lift up to 200 kilograms. They're kind of uber human, but at the same time, they're um, slaves and they're slaves that are depicted somewhat as human form. So I find that really interesting. And my work can often just wander into different um, different media. So here we see a sculpture, of course, in, in air quotes, because uh, the sculpture is in the virtual space. But that happens then that I that I take my, my work and I, I put it in a different context. So this um, is a is an NFT I did, or uh, just a digital animation, basically. It, it ended up being an NFT. And you can see it here. And this is part of like me working with these uh, ideas of fetishization, but also throwing the gaze back. So, so there is this this female gaze that is being projected onto the the onlooker always. And and in this NFT, I've I've kind of played with that aesthetic that you have this turning uh, of a work and it's a prize. And nobody really decided what an NFT work, uh, why it has to have this particular aesthetic. It's not. I mean could be anything. I, I talked to Simon about this. It could be a sentence, for instance. Um, but but we have this aesthetic, and I like to kind of also um, put it into a context where it's um, making fun of itself also. So you have this fetish object, but it's also kind of repelling and looking back and, and turning until uh, eternity in a 15-second loop. So that's, in a nutshell, what I'm doing at the moment. And, and what I'm dealing with when I when I do these things. Thank you so much, uh, very much for that um, introduction, Charlie. Um, and I'd just like to say that, of course, I'm an artist and you're an artist, but we're not all artists on this panel. Um, so, uh, um, but I would like to take a transition from your presentation. I noticed that your NFT was presented on Foundation, um, a very prominent um, NFT marketplace and panel uh, and we have uh, the honor of having Lindsay Howard, uh, one of the, uh, the, I believe you're the chief, uh, the chief curator of, uh, or the head of community at Foundation. Lindsay, I know you've um, been very um, prominent in bringing people to that very successful, very visible platform. So perhaps this is um, a decent segue into uh, you presenting as well. And I'd just like to remind us um, briefly, you're talking about uh, who you are and what you do, but also a moment where you've interacted with ethics in, in the art and technology space, if you can recall. I'm <laughs> uh, trying to get my lighting right over here. Um, thank you for the introduction, Simon. Um, I'm Lindsay Howard. I've been working as a curator specializing in digital art for the last 10 years. And as a kind of segue in that process, got very interested in the markets or lack of market around digital work. And I personally identify as an intersectional feminist. And so I'm always interested in how various forms of oppression, whether that's class, race, gender, immigrant status can intersect with one another um, to um, really create uh, very difficult um, inequalities. And what I have started to recognize in my work as a curator supporting artists has really been about um, how many equals power. And so I've really been very interested in how to uh, redistribute wealth to creative communities, particularly um, uplifting and supporting marginalized creators and artists whose voices have been historically underrepresented. 
um, this journey led me to working with galleries and auction houses in a more kind of traditional tra trajectory. And then starting last year, I joined Foundation as their head of community and have been able to be more active in this space and bringing more funding to artists and to the creative, um, to creative um, individuals. So Foundation is a platform that aims to build a new creative economy. Um, where artists are using the Ethereum blockchain to value their online expression in entirely new ways. Um, that's really important to me. Um, in my observations as a curator, I've seen so many artists give away their work for free and not be compensated uh, for time, for their creativity, um, or for the value and recognition that they receive through likes or shares or retweets. Um, and so I see the NFT space although it's not perfect, I see it as an opportunity for us to start to bring even just conceptual value, if not actual tangible value, um, to creative expression online. Um, so how does this translate into foundation as a platform? Um, in my assessment, capitalism um, has, has taught consumers how to think about value using a very complicated formula of usefulness, desirability and availability. And this has led to creating inequitable systems in the contemporary art world um, that have often encouraged and privileged a certain type of individual. Um, by having the opportunity to work on foundation um, as head of community and start to build something from scratch, um, been putting a lot of emphasis on creating a new network and ecosystem that is more community driven um, by the artists themselves. So one way that we're doing this is um, it's a it's an invite only platform right now, and artists invite other artists. Um, this invite this invitation system has helped to kind of counteract the traditional hierarchies of the contemporary art world, um, and has been more focused on driving a kind of peer to peer and community led style of curation, which as a curator is actually something quite interested in. I think. Um, Historically, curation has been very problematic in terms of who's been able to be let into um, the ivory tower in institutions. Um, and then also, you know, as part of uplifting and supporting marginalized creators and artists, um, we have seen how the invite system has unlocked not only different types of works, but also geographically been able to um, introduce the NFT space and NFT tools and resources to people all over the world. Um, so we've seen artists from Tokyo and Ethiopia extend their invitations throughout their local networks and be able to create these kind of sub communities within the community and have these really vibrant um, networks and connections and relationships. So, um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we had Itzel Yard, the, an, art, an artist in this space, um, become the top selling woman in the NFT um, space ecosystem. Um, her piece sold for $2 million um, as a benefit for the tour project. Um, this was a first for a generative artist and a first for um, a black female artist and female artist in general. Um, so this is a really fabulous accomplishment for the space. Um, we've also seen women who are able to kind of quit their day job and move into creating art full time. And then seven out of the top 25 creators um, in terms of sales on foundation are women as well. So this is really like what we're trying to do and create uh, new cultural paradigms um, through NFTs and through crypto. Wow. Getting some, getting some microphone noise there. Thank you so much for that, Lindsay. That was uh, an inspiring uh, presentation and a great intro to your activity. Um, Perhaps um, from one type of institution to another, um, I might uh, invite um, Troy uh, to speak now. Um, you've worked in and out of a number of different contexts. I know you're knowledgeable about all sorts of types of technology, Troy, but um, uh, you recently were at um, the Guggenheim um, as a digital curator for many years, but you're moving on to many other projects now. Do you want to speak to uh, who you are, what you've been doing, and, and perhaps a run you've had with some ethics um, in your Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Simon. Thanks for the uh, invitation. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I spent the last seven years or so in that ivory tower um, working at the Guggenheim um, and quit recently and maybe um, 
Yeah, just as by way of a little bit of background, uh, my name is Troy Terrian. I, I studied computer engineering, worked in Silicon Valley during the dot-com boom and bubble. Um, so that's kind of how old I am. Um, and then uh, went into architecture, um, basically got kind of rerouted again through another financial crisis, and then eventually sort of ended up kind of crab walking in a strange way into a museum, which was not my training. It was not my, it was not sort of my ambition. It was just a kind of incredible opportunity. Um, and so I joined the Guggenheim seven years ago. Um, and there's a few projects there when I was just, you know, si Simon, you sent around this question before the panel. I was thinking about how to answer it with kind of concrete examples. Um, one was the first project I did at the Guggenheim was a, it was the, the museum's first ever online exhibition. This was like 2015. Um, it was a project called uh, Ozone Futures Market, which Ryan will remember because he was actually a kind of contributor to. Um, and um, the basically what we created was this was sort of, you know, Bitcoin was around, Ethereum was just getting off the ground, but it was still very much a kind of grassroots kind of fringe operation. Um, and uh, and the Guggenheim wouldn't have let me play with real money anyways. Um, so we created a kind of fake uh, uh, market that you could, you know, it was an app on the internet. You could sign up and you got some free tokens and you could invest in futures. Um, those futures were created by a series of, were kind of defined by a series of artists and philosophers and kind of, you know, thinkers, thought leaders and whatnot. Um, and it was, you know, it was like 36, I think, of them. And, and off the top of my head, there was things like robotic medicine and planetary life. And there was this whole kind of economy of knowledge sharing um, where in order to make a trade, the, the kind of gas money for making your trade um, was to share a piece of information. Um, and it's it's really interesting looking back now because that was, you know, six years ago. And the ethical conversations we were having at the time um, where, you know, a museum is a pretty big megaphone. Um, you can do a terrible project at a museum and there's still going to be a lot of press. Um, and so the question for us was like, what, what were the, what were the futures that we were kind of going to put into the ether? Um, and, you know, because they, they have a kind of, you know, positive feedback effect around them. They end up kind of, you know, um, congealing momentum by virtue of kind of being put into kind of, you know, cultural forms in these institutions. Um, and it, if I were to go back and do it again, I probably would have been a little bit more shy about it because here we are five years later and, you know, we're, we're all lining up to get roboticized medicine and so on, right? So it's uh, it's it's kind of a weird um, cognitive dissonance over time in terms of how ethics shift so quickly when you're dealing with technology, um, even when you try to be kind of forward thinking. Um, another ethical moment that came to mind in, in preparing for the panel was um, a kind of a bigger one in my life. Uh, I spent the last five years working on a, a big exhibition that was at the Guggenheim in the Rotunda about the topic of the countryside with a, a kind of quite well-known architect. Um, and over the course of that, the research that I did for that project led me to a few kind of you know, conclusions or thoughts that were quite harrowing um, about the fragility of food security, uh, the fact that, you know, there's, 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 there's predictions that we've got about 40 years of topsoil left in the entire planet. And then it's, you know, and then it's Matthew McConaughey and Interstellar. Um, so there's, you know, it started to really kind of, um, uh, I was diving into it through a kind of technology, you know, we wanted to do blockchain and crypto and all kinds of crazy things. And in the end, I ended up realizing that the, the most basic technologies, like literally growing, growing your own food, um, became something that started to feel much more urgent for me. Um, and so I've actually quit my job at the Guggenheim um, and uh, now bought a little small plot of land with my with my partner in the countryside and uh, and are starting to develop a, a kind of permaculture and food forest kind of regenerative farming because I, I didn't have an answer to where my food came from. And I, I kind of I want to be able to answer that. And I also wouldn't, wouldn't mind being able to give food to others. And the last thing just to close, I think I might be running out of time, but the last one was just the reason the kind of catalyst to quit my job at the Guggenheim was I was witness to and, and asked to participate in um, basically a, a really vile um, example of cancel culture that I thought was really unfounded. And it, 
you know, re seeing it from the inside, you know, rather than just from like the, the retweets or whatever that happens on the outside. On the inside, you see that that cancel culture in the case that I experienced it was just used to reproduce the power systems of the most wealthy and most powerful people when they wanted to kind of kick somebody out of their job so they could take it and do it in the name of people of color and so on. And it was it was really shocking to me when I revealed to them that I myself was a citizen of an indigenous nation, um, that they still couldn't see me as anything but a white man or somebody that might have something more to add to that conversation. So anyways, I kind of started to get grossed out by that world and decided to leave it. And I'm now working on a number of things, um, but we can get to that maybe on a subsequent panel. So thanks. Thanks so much, Troy. Um, a few examples there that we can return to perhaps in a group discussion. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Alana now. Uh, if I hope that, or Alana, I'm not sure if I... Um, You're right, Alana. Okay, fantastic. So I'd love, love to hear from you. Um, this is one of the a few people I'm moving, meeting on this uh, Zoom for the first time. So um, great, yes. great to see you, Alana. You too. Thank you for having me. And Lindsay was doing her lighting and I was doing my camera, so hopefully you can see me. My husband's too tall. Um, I am publisher and CRO of Decrypt. Decrypt is a crypto publication. And why are we, am I talking about NFTs on this, in this conversation? Well, I, introduction about me, I come from Silicon Valley as well. Uh, so I'm also aging myself. And I had a number of startups, mostly in media. So I worked in media. I built algorithms for media, especially tracking algorithms. So I apologize in advance. I have many sins to atone for. Um, and kind of moved into, from media into crypto, the lens of running advertising standards. So I ran ad standards globally for about two years. And in that process, I saw the need for a human interaction across the board to track fraud, um, as well as to track just instances of fraud and algorithms. Um, so I started using blockchain. And Fast forward, it did an ICO. I did all the things you know that we did in crypto uh, in the heyday of, of the ICO market for a company called Medex. We launched Ad Token, and I joined Consensus. And Decrypt is part of Consensus; they're funded by Consensus, um, but it's an independent news organization. And I did number, a number of things there. I ran Identity. Um, I ran the media business there, and now I'm publisher of Crypt. Um, and what I'm finding is our clients, our advertiser clients have introduced us to a number of different creatives. I define creatives, artists, writers, carpenters even, um, who are looking to learn about the NFT space. And I found this niche right now at least where I am basically the hub of communication between artist, platform, and anything in between. So helping to talk about rights and the legal perspective. And if you have talent in your video, what do you do? Do you have to, in the U.S., report to, to the SAG folks? And all these things that I think from a minutia perspective have brought up just the age-old question of how do you do business? And I think it was Lindsay who said, how do you enable newcomers into the media world? And to me, NFTs boil down to you're creating art, you'd like to sell it, you have a market to sell it to, you have a subject that you're creating around, how do you enter into the market in the most fulfilled and logical way and compete with the, the big guns, if you will? And so that's what I've been thinking about really heavily is how do we make things more equal for players to come in and, and enter into the, the market? And we see folks like Beeple and, and PAC, et cetera, doing that. And, you know, there's a whole host of history behind that. But how do we think about this market as a reset uh, of the art world? And I, I love that. So that's kind of what I'm thinking about. And we're actually creating Decrypt Studios, which is just that. It's, it's an agency model where we're helping artists figure out this landscape, and we're trying to enable them to come in and not get screwed over. <laughs> by any contracts, and just to learn and to compete uh, across the board in an equal way. That's also sounding very inspiring, and I have to say quite a cohesive group. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the group discussion here. There's a lot to uh, speak back to. Um, and uh, from one entrepreneur to another, perhaps, um, I'd like to shift gear again and uh, uh, tap Brian. Um, 
uh, on the shoulder because I know um, you've worked also across these contexts, but at the moment you're um, a technologist and an entrepreneur more than an artist and a creative, if I can, if I can be so bold. So perhaps you can speak from uh, that side of the, of the transition. Um, uh, sure, yeah. So my name is Ryan. I'm co-founder and CEO of Foam, uh, which is an Ethereum-based protocol uh, working on location services, uh, mainly right now on alternative location services to GPS. Um, but to wind that back, uh, we started the project in 2015 uh, before Ethereum had really launched. And we started it as a street architecture competition uh, with the New Museum. And they had wanted to see mobile architecture. So I think that means you could like pack it up in a truck and drive it somewhere else. Uh, but we applied about mobilizing value that would be generated from this one day event. And so the physical installation was like the blockchain made of foam um, with like 10 foot tall blocks. And it took over the street of the Bowery, kind of like a super studio uh, structure. And the idea was anyone who came and participated and like spoke to us uh, would get a foam space coin. And that was on counterparty on Bitcoin at the time. Um, and then because these were industrial blocks, we uh, had these trucks come and we sold them back to uh, the supply chain, essentially. Um, and so that did a number of things. It gave us a budget to continue working on the project uh, that would, you know, relate to all these people who got these foam space coins. But it also helped the artwork escape the system of uh, the institution. So uh, our, the previous winners of that competition, their architecture, quote unquote, is just sitting in the basement of the new museum where we actually dissipated the art uh, architecture piece and turned it into something that could be mobilized of value. And we used the funds there to make a new installation uh, many months later called the Tropical Mining Station, uh, which was a physical manifestation of like the hot air created from miners and uh, made a pneumatic bottle. Uh, Troy was in the first one uh, in the presentation and in the second iteration at Ethereal uh, is how I kind of came across Simon. and. From that, it was kind of about how do we keep transitioning value to different projects and over time. And uh, at some point, we did make the transition from being like a architecture art project to actually wanting to work on a protocol. And I think that just kind of saw of to the question of ethics. We came at it originally of how can we change physics space? How can we improve spaces? How can we have mixed uses? How can we have shared ownership? And we were always about doing things with blockchain in the physical space, uh, which moves a lot slower than just launching software. Um, but we've made that kind of decision of just being so excited about the artwork and kind of the potential and the initial feedback. Uh, we opened a Slack group in like 2016 and, you know, 40 people were talking nonstop and seeing uh, kind of the encouragement that you could translate uh, from the art side into actually maybe a product or even company that would actually have a massive impact. And so we've made this transition from being like an art studio to currently working on uh, hardware and radio devices that will soon be available if you want to be an early participant. So. so interesting. And I've only seen windows into that world um, as I've met you at various ages, Ryan. So good to hear a kind of cohesive narrative of that. Um, also onto a, a voice which um, I've not been in direct dialogue with uh, and welcome um, to the room, Krista. Um, I've, uh, I've been asking uh, people um, who are in this uh, to introduce who they are and what, they, what they're up to, um, but also to bring up an anecdote um, where um, let's say art, technology, and ethics meet in your experience. Um, uh, so I would uh, warmly invite you to do that. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm so happy to be here with all of you. Um, my name is Krista Kim, and I'm a digital artist. I'm the creator of the Mars House, um, the first uh, digital NFT house uh, in the world. And um, I've been practicing digital art since 2013. I've been really concerned with, um, you know, the disruptive effects of digital technology and well-being, especially the negative effects of social media on our society, widespread. We have the highest percentage of uh, depressed and lonely young people ever in, in human history. And you can attribute that to social media and the way that it's designed. So I'm really, you know, questioning uh, the concept of technology and how we're actually using it, whether or not we can actually use technology as a method of healing and well-being. I practice meditation daily, and so my art really is like an iteration of meditativeness. And I'm trying to bring that meditativeness into the digital language, if you will. So Mars House is really uh, a study of how you can integrate, uh, you know, screens, screens that are usually used to um, 
you know, control us or, or give us inform- mis- misinformation sometimes, a lot of it nowadays. And uh, distraction, disruption. I want to use screen to heal and to spread, uh, you know, wellness and meditativeness. So Mars House, we have um, uh, substrates, uh, LED screens uh, on the floor and ceiling. Why can't we actually have entire floors, ceilings, and walls of screens? The technology is coming, you know, catching up so that we can actually have this integrated into our architecture. So why not experiment with that? And then also because of my time in Japan when I lived there for four years, I just love being in Kyoto. Kyoto is a wonderful city where the philosophy of Zen is pervasive in every aspect of their lives, uh, from kaiseki cuisine to uh, the dress and uh, the music, um, ceramics. But what really struck me was the digital Zen garden because you have, for example, in Tokyo, a very, very bustling metropolis. And then you can also find a beautiful Zen garden in the middle of the city that actually helps you relax, that brings you a state of calm. And the reason why is because there's a lot of space in between the stones, uh, the rocks, the large rocks. And that's because it's supposed to bring negative space into the mind. So that negative space brings forth an altered state of consciousness, a Zen state of consciousness. And that's sort of what I'm trying to do with my work. I'm trying to create a state of Zen. There's so much distraction, so much light, so much data, data pollution. I want to streamline that and I want to um, communicate pure consciousness through light and sound from the screen. And so Mars House is an installation. It essentially is a giant light sculpture of my work but it's also uh, a metaverse house, a house of NFTs of the next generation. And to your question and your inquiry about where NFTs can go and humanism, I believe that um, as artists, we can actually use NFTs as a vehicle for good and uh, social change. Because we can actually, now that we don't have so many intermediaries, Uh, We have direct access to um, and relationships with the collectors. We can actually create uh, wonderful initiatives to improve society. So, for example, with the sale of the Mars House, the majority of the proceeds are going toward the Continuum Foundation, which which is actually funding my sound and light healing installation tour with Jeff Schroeder of the Smashing Pumpkins. He's going to be playing meditative scores on his electric guitar, I put up a giant screen and play my meditative uh, sound and light video installations for the public to come and enjoy. The first installation is in August. Then we go to uh, in Toronto, August 20th to 22nd. Then we go to Venice, September 13th to the 19th. And then we go to Miami during Miami Basel for the first week of December, uh, first week of December. So I believe that NFTs can actually, uh, for example, uh, be, you know, you can actually have multiple wallets on NFTs or eventually most platforms will allow this. Why not have a charitable organization attached to your NFT? And so um, I'm actually global ambassador for um, a platform called Superworld App. And Superworld App is very exciting because we are actually an interface of augmented reality for the world. The entire world is mapped and we have uh, virtual land that are NFTs, and you can upload 3D digital assets and mint them uh, onto Superworld. So we, we're actually going to start initiatives where you can actually purchase a piece of the Amazon forest and proceeds will go to a charitable organization that is action-oriented that will actually um, preserve and, and help you conserve and protect uh, that uh, plot of land, etc. So this is this is the possibility. Very inspiring. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Um, and uh, what an amazing group of people we have in the room here. Um, uh, on to um, one uh, more voice uh, to introduce um, themselves and what they're up to before we uh, go into something as a group, I guess. Uh, Matt, would you like to um, 
uh, speak to us about uh, who you are and, and, and a moment in ethics for you. Sure. Uh, my name is Matt Kane. Uh, I've been an artist for 20 years. I started out um, a painter who was represented in galleries around 2003 in Chicago. Um, and then eventually I went into web development where I taught myself to program. And then since 2014, I've been building my own um, custom digital studio software that I now use to make my paintings. Um, most recently, um, I've, I've been uh, part of uh, Natively Digital alongside you, Simon, um, which has been, uh, it, was, it was a real pleasure uh, when, I, when I saw the artist announced because I saw your, your exhibition in 2017 at the Hammer Museum. And so that was one of my first stops at Art on the Blockchain. Uh, so it was, it was a real pleasure. Um, I've been watching NFTs uh, since, since 2017. I joined as an artist in 2019. Um, I'm going to share my screen if I can. Yes. So uh, to speak a little bit about what, what I have at Sotheby's as a work after Claude Monet, I create master copies after Claude Monet in 2019. I visited the Art Institute of Chicago and so in this CryptoVoxels exhibition, I have his work on the interior walls, and then I have my work on the exterior walls, which are, which are after him. And so it was kind of taking that traditional studio practice of um, deeply studying a master and then creating work after him. And I won't go through all of these. Uh, all of this is linked from my Twitter if you'd like to come back here. But because I want to get into sort of the ethical uh, part of part of this discussion, um, this is, this is the, the painting itself that is uh, showing. And it was very important for me uh, to short, sort of show the, the culture that has sprung up around NFTs that I've been part of the last two and a half years. Um, and part of that is building these, these uh, crypto voxel exhibitions, metaverse exhibitions. And you can see that that this is the painting's um, layers broken up in, and that this is how I've wanted my work to be exhibited for 20 years now. I had I first had a vision of walking through my work in a dream 20 years ago, and so now uh, with this work at Sotheby's, really inviting viewers, you know, to to come in, um, and of course from one position it's the painting perfectly, and then you can uh, you can step through through the um, and so that was very exciting for me. And I, and I, part of, part of this is I wanted to show what could the, um, auction page, the lot page, you know, look like trans transformed to the metaverse. And so, so I, I sort of created a whole like museum exhibition, a virtual museum exhibition, um, around my work. Um, and a little bit of a background on the work. Is, is that uh, this painting by Monet sold for $110 million a week after I minted and sold my first NFT. And back then I sold it for $85 because that's where the market was at. And while I was making uh, my master copy, um, a day after that sold for $110 million, I sort of thought, wouldn't it be amazing if I could use NFT provenance to like connect this one day? And of course I thought this will happen in 50 years and I'll be dead. But a month ago, um, Sotheby's reached out to me and I said, you know what, I have the perfect artwork for this. Um, and so, you know, I created this and this is linked from the Sotheby's website. And so it's gotten a lot of traffic. And part of what I've, the art movement I've participated in is one in which we work, uh, artists support each other towards reaching a non-zero sum game. And so after I built this exhibition, I was like, I got a lot of room on, on the roof. And I've been collecting NFTs. I've been putting, you know, last year I put 30%, whenever I would sell an NFT, I would put like 30% back into the community. So I would buy, buy other artists' work. And so I decided I would take 64 artists who I feel don't get enough attention in the space, I haven't gone on platforms like Nifty Gateway, so where, where they get like a big amplified, you know, microphone. And so I, I decided to take these artists and, um, put up a pop-up show and, and host that. And Sotheby's was totally great about it and they were very supportive. And so I've had a lot of traffic coming through here. Um, 
And this is this is all about a non-zero sum game. And that's sort of like, you know, the ethical framework that I've been working in uh, with NFTs. And for me, I've I've had a lot of um, uh, I've had a lot of success that's that's sort of I consider uncommon. And so what I like to do with that is look for opportunities where I can share the light with with other artists. And when I'm having success, I don't want it to be just like the Matt Cain show and Matt Cain successful and you're all losing. I want it to be, you know, more artists are winning because I'm successful, you know, and that's that's sort of um, what that's what the culture has been until recently. Right. And. And we stopped seeing that 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 cultural tradition that's been there for like two years that stopped recently, right? And everyone knows what I'm talking about. And so it's important. And so it's important for me just modeling. I'm at Sotheby's. What does it look like for a crypto artist to come to Sotheby's? Well, they're going to support their fellow artists. They're going to show metaverse builds. They're going to show, you know, so th these sort of like cultural traditions and and show evidence, you know that this artist has not just been you know selling work and hoarding the money away for myself i've been i've been you know investing it back into the community and so by i'm hoping that you know by there there is the technology of nfts but more importantly there is the culture right and we can inject into the culture by modeling these kind of behaviors and passing it on um, the sort of interactions human to human that we want to see more of Thank you so much, Matt. That's a, a very spirited introduction to your uh, position in that as well. And I see some uh, light bubbles going in there, um, a great presentation as well. Um, so maybe this is the moment to um, uh, open it up to a larger discussion. Um, and I think one thing I can synthesize from the discussion already is um, there's a big uh, uh, investment in the idea of access. Um, I think in in the blockchain space and in the NFT space, um, and I guess what I do as an artist, I didn't introduce myself so much, but um, is uh, I I like to look at the rhetorical claims of technologists. That's my favorite um, activity, and uh, and and kind of drill down on what they what they promise on. And um, so maybe I can bring that to the group here, where there seems to be a really uh, strong investment in this idea that. Um, uh, giving access to uh, systems um, to more people um, is uh, a way of uh, pushing back on some of the negatives of systems that we all participate in. Um, and I wonder if I could open up to the group to anybody that would like to speak to that idea, since there, I think there are so many people invested in that. Um, I'll, I'll start since there's silence. Um, it, so from my perspective, the access question is, is paramount because I think it, it, the, the medium is so new that it, it, again, gives a reset to the marketplace and to the entrance coming in. And so we have a moment in time to create a whole new experience because of the newness factor. And I, I love the Sotheby's example with the metaverse installations. I love the fact that we're now bringing in other aspects of our world that the public hasn't seen before, right? You know, like crypto voxels is not a mainstream idea. So it's, it's access to people and to groups, but it's also access to technologies as well. It's opening up the kimono and showing the world, the cyberpunk world as well as allowing women, indigenous peoples, uh, people of color, people who have not historically been allowed the same access and conversation. Um, I think we have to think of it in kind of a, a broad strokes term of people plus tech plus experiences. That's important to me and to decrypt. Thank you very much. Does anybody have... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I would just add that I think well, I know that technology on its own is not neutral and blockchain on its own is not going to do the work that the kinds of biases or prejudices or inequalities that exist in other spaces are going to be carried over into the NFT space or into blockchain um, unless we actively look at this as an opportunity to, as Alana says, reset. Um, and that doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come easily. It actually really requires a lot of coordination and intention and thoughtfulness and care to be able to build those kinds of spaces. And I think that's a responsibility that we all have right now as 
we're looking at a potential to either reconfigure auction houses or reconfigure an art market or reconfigure how um, currency exists and the power that's tied to it. Um, I completely agree. Um, I, I actually want to mention that uh, the projects that I'm involved in um, actually, uh, we, we are actually concerned with, with these issues. And um, there's a platform called 888 The New World um, that is launching in September, and it is founded by artists. Um, I'm, I happen to be included in the group and with the collector 888. And if you look at the entire uh, intention of the platform, um, it is basically to uplift and to be inclusive for all artists, including artists in developing countries or underprivileged uh, areas where you know some artists cannot afford the technology or are not trained uh, in using computers to, to create art. So um, we basically take 8.88% uh, of the sales from the platform, but 100% of the sales are donated to a, a, a foundation that supports a, a crew of people that travel to underprivileged areas and actually train and scout um, these artisans. And these artisans who are part of, uh, artists who are part of the program, uh, they actually retain 100% of their, their sales um, to support uh, themselves and their communities, of course. So this is um, uh, a systemic change, and uh, it is on the, you know, the actual the platform that, that is initiating this change. So it's, it's very different and it's new. It is, it's a great experiment. Um, yeah, so here's one example. Something I'm, I'm really um, kind of quite interested in is anonymity or pseudonymity. So a number of the people that are, you know, minting on these platforms are doing so under you know, Twitter and Instagram handles, but they're not attached to, you know, IRL meet space identities, which I think is really interesting. I'm interested to see how the art world will kind of uh, parse and digest that because there's so much about personality, identity, where you come from, what you look like, who you are, where you've been, um, that in some cases, you know, can be shaped and molded and, is, and can dictate the career of an artist. Um, there's something that I find really interesting about the purity of, of like, um, you know, someone being able to craft a new identity in this you know, kind of almost cyberpunk environment where you are your handle and you are your work. Um, and I don't think it's a kind of utopian or idealistic thing because, of course, all the same kind of machinations come into play and will come into play in all of these different, you know, examples of the metaverse. Um, but I think there's a really interesting moment right now where you have um, artists that are, you know, doing very strange, interesting things with code, with visuals, with aesthetics, with the way that they shape themselves, the way that they market themselves, and they're doing it without a physical identity or a profile picture or a LinkedIn page, um, which I think is a really interesting complement to the possibility of opening up access to people that would, because of the nature of who they are, their identity and so on, might have been otherwise excluded from these platforms. So there's there's kind of like, there's, the, there's kind of a control group and an experimental group or something happening at the same time that I think both are very interesting. A great augmentation of the access argument. Um, does anybody else feel like I don't want to monopolize the direction of this conversation? Um, as I say, I, I heard access as being a key thing um, that we're all interested in. But uh, if, if all of you also have other thoughts on what you'd like to um, address uh, in the panel, please, uh, please go ahead. Um, from my side, um, I, uh, I'm glad that, uh, Troy, you brought up the anonymity uh, um, example because I think um, – you know, um, and and also, uh, um, Krista, you brought up um, the idea as well uh, that um, you know only access is not um, is not enough. And I think perhaps that's something that Matt would agree with as well. Um, that once one has access, then there's also um, potential for uh, I guess ways of shaping from the inside, um, other ways of doing things. Um, I don't know if that's something that you all uh, would relate to, but I'm. I'm yes, absolutely. I mean. It's something that I've really experienced last year during um, the pandemic is that I, I'm part of a lot of female networks. So 
we had this, there was all this, uh, the Me Too movement and everything, but all of a sudden you have digital spaces where you can communicate and you can meet again and you, you have a, a certain degree of anonymity also when you do your research. So for a lot of women, it was really eye opening, um, just the idea that they're not alone. And that is not just part of that movement, but also about the discussions later on that you that you're all of a sudden the conversations have shifted and you're able to talk about things that just basically weren't in the conversation before. And that is something that the digital space and I'm I'm neither neither tech optimist nor tech pessimist, but I think it's really important. That's also why I, why when I had the chance to to create an NFT, it's something that I want to do because I want to be able to see how do the things work that that are shaping our times, right? And also the conversations that evolved around us. I guess all of us were stuck on Clubhouse for at least a, a some amount of time last year. And and for me, it was so great that there were people that were reading the conversations from their screen because they because of a um, because of auditive disabilities they could not um, hear the conversations. But these people um, normally they they can't just go to a gallery opening and and say hey wait I, I want to throw in this bit of theory that I've read and all of a sudden you you have these people there we can't go anywhere so there were these little like glimpses of of a really beautiful society that I was really excited by that would not have happened had we not had these digital spaces. Yeah, that's a that's a great observation. Uh, I think access is something that we all agree uh, is perhaps um, at the top of these conversations about ethics and um, and certainly arts and NFTs and the blockchain. Um, are there ethical concerns uh, that all of you are passionate about that you feel are underrepresented in conversations around um, art and technology at the moment? I'd be really interested to hear people bump other things to the top of the conversation rather than go with what is um, what is at the moment uh, the yeah one of the more visible taglines of the. I think uh, I think Francisco has something to add. Having physical spaces is obviously resonates with me for my project, but I think that's area that's definitely underexplored. And um, as we saw with this kind of Sotheby's metaverse, that people actually are going to be building up collections. And then maybe the new frontier is like how the actual gallery space or the museum space itself, um, as most museums are kind of contemporary and similar inside. How, how can you know screens or environments actually like transform? how we experience art, but that it's a living economy. Maybe people are actually trading or buying uh, while they're in these kind of new kinds of spaces. And so I think that for me is a new thing over the last five years. We're thinking about blockchain and economy and tokens and how can we change real space. But when you actually bring in art and des design and that it actually has like a flywheel system of inputs, outputs, uh, ownership and feedback, I think that we barely scratched the surface. Yeah, totally. Elena, did I did I see you almost speak before? I almost beeped in, yeah. So uh, the ethical questions are interesting, right? And I think that there's a lot of buzzwords right now around environmental impacts. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. I'm just saying, you know, we're talking about that as an industry right now. Um, different, different chains, different side chains. Everyone's pitching now in this environmental friendly way. And I think that you have to be careful that the reality is that we are if we are pitching in those terms, we are conserving energy and we are uh, kind of moving down the right path. That's, that's number one. And then number two, you know, I see the same old, same old from an ethics perspective um, in the market where people are now trying to exploit artists yet again in terms of contracts, especially middlemen, agents coming in and trying to broker deals for artists. You know, the same law, I'm married to an artist, so I, I, I'm very protective of the space in general, just kind of trying to figure out how to help and, and not allow the same thing to happen again. The platforms are doing a good job because everything is transparent. The fees, how to mint, the gas fees, depending on what platform you're using. I just worry that down the road, that transparency will go away with, with the broker model coming back into the mix again. Do we lose our moderator? <laughs> uh oh. I'll, 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 
I'll, ju I'll jump in with an ethical concern. Okay, go ahead. Really <laughs> okay. Um, my main ethical concern has been watching how um, some collectors think about and treat artists like an altcoin because a lot of collectors come from the cryptocurrency trading. And that's And so naturally they look at assets on the blockchain and they, they just automatically think of artists as just a dogecoin you know or i won't use the, the the dirty s word but you know and artists 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 are sort of you know allowing themselves you know to be seen this way and treated this way um and it it makes it's very cringy for me um to to watch that and i and i think that as we watch some of the artists who have um outlier success, um, you know, who have gone along with that and and they're good with treating themselves as an altcoin. And that's what people are looking towards, like as an example, as a role model. I'm afraid that we're going to see that model perpetuate. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if anyone else. But don't you think that that, that kind of mirrors the, the age old patron model of art in general? Like I totally hear you and, and I, I was alluding to that when I was talking about the broker models, but yes, the collectors, they act as, as Patreon, as patron, and they, uh -huh. they start commissioning works, and the DAOs do the same thing. DAOs are just another example of a, a larger patron, right, because they have multiple individuals. Um, and I agree with you. I, I think that, you know, just as Parker has influenced the wine market, will the DAOs and the collectors start influencing the crypto market to their tastes? I don't know the answer to that, but I, I they, they have. I watched it happen. Right. I, so I honestly can I. I think that you know these are very valid points, but I think that we have so much more capital as artists now because we are skimming off the the intermediaries and in many of our many of our sales now. So that means that we have more freedom to make that choice as artists. So where where do we put the money now? We're going to put that. We should put that money into social capital. We should put it, you know, back into actually adding value into the communities and and affecting culture in a positive way. And I think that it's up to us. And I, I agree, it's a choice of every artist. Are you going to be a crypto coin, or are you going to be an artist? An artist makes culture, right? And I think that we all have to, you know, really understand what the role of art is. Very important, especially now during this very pivotal, disruptive period of of our times, where there's a lot of chaos. And a lot of people are going to look to art to see hope and a vision for the future. So yes, it is a, it, it, it's the role of the artist to, to make that choice and to, to create a new society. Where's our moderator? <laughs> We're on our own, guys. We're going to be naughty. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you. I just worry that the influence of being paid, oh, and this is always the case, right? It doesn't matter what market you're in. When you start getting investment from collectors, then it could be that your art changes form just because of what their tastes are, what they want to achieve. But I think, you know, that's the human condition in general as well. So I think you're right. You have to fight the power and figure that out. No, I, I think honestly, my collectors, when I, I have a wonderful relationship with them. So it's not like, so you can actually communicate and say, they're like, okay, Krista, so we want to support your vision. We want to support you as an artist. What is your vision? We're not investing in the art. We're investing in the artist and the vision. And that's refreshing. And I've never had that conversation in the traditional art market. I've, I'm having it in crypto because you also have a culture of people who are revolutionaries, if you will, right? So these people actually, through the crypto revolution, they want to create a better world. And so a lot of them also have, not all, but a lot of them do have this vision of building a better future and using art as a way of actually creating new cultures. So that's, that's also another thing. Yeah, I agree point. with you. A lot of people um, came into this. They wanted to get rid of, you know, middlemen. Like, like for Bitcoin, it's getting rid of the bankers, right? That those are the yeah. middlemen. With with crypto art, it, it it was, you know, how do we how do we and that I don't want to say get rid of the gallerist, but how do, how do we position the gallerist to to do their, you know, 
probably empower the, the the galleries to do their their job in a way you know where they feel more fulfilled as well. Um, but 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 again, you know, it, it is about ultimately about the middlemen. So so it, it's I'm really happy for you that you've had those experiences and met collectors who are like oh, yeah. that. But I so have much. too. It's it's great. It, right? It's amazing. These kinds of conversations never had them before. And I'm not saying that we don't need curators and institutions. I think that they also play a wonderful role. But let's not have them dictate everything and be gatekeepers for what the definition of art is. Let the public determine that, you know? Let culture determine that and let artists lead instead of the institutions and, and the gatekeepers. Aren't these just new gatekeepers? The artists themselves? No, yeah, the collectors, I, the the DeFi degens, the people with you know big crypto roles. I, in my mind, you know, you had you had robber barons a hundred years ago that were were doing this. Now you've got not to say these are bad people; they're not. Um, I'm you know I'm kind of one of them, and I mix with them, and I've been in crypto for quite a while myself. I think it's really interesting to see how these new collectors are coming along, how they're inventing what it means to be a patron and collector now, um, the speed at which they can operate, the way they're creating new funding models. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think it's. I don't think that gatekeeping is going anywhere. I think it's it's shifting, and the nature of it's shifting. But there's always, you know, it's 